pull it up? I'll tell you what, why don't we, uh, we, we can table that for now. Um, hopefully everybody got a pretty basic understanding of Robert's Rules of Order and maybe we can kind of do that as part of our follow-up meeting for our next meeting. Okay. Um, click it right quick, let me see. Yeah, we'll, we'll table that for now, Ms. Ford, and uh, revisit the video at our next meeting. Um, so let's move forward with the next item on the agenda. Okay, perfect. And each member um, should have a link to that video. I put it in the chat as well as through the email invite. So you can feel free to view that. And then if necessary, we can do it live on the next meeting. But Next item on the agenda is actually voting for the chair and the co-chair. So that is up to you as board members to e uh, elect your chair and your co-chair. So at this point, I will entertain a motion on filling the chair and co-chair responsibilities. Anyone can nominate any member of the board to be chair or co-chair by making a motion. Mr. Adams, are you still with us? Is, is a member able to nominate themselves by motion? This is Rodney Jones, I'll nominate me. All right, do I have a second? A second. All right, we have okay, moving we'll second. take a vote. Um, District one, Ms. Anita Bellinger. I concur. District two, Mrs. Wanda Adipo. Adipo? You can just call me Wanda. That's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, and I, I, I approve. District three, Mr. Alan Kelly. Uh, yes. District four, Ms. Barbara Mustella Oliver. I concur. District seven, Mr. Rodney Jones. I agree. Congratulations, Mr. Jones. You are the inaugural chair of the Parks Advisory Board. And now we will take a motion for a co-chair. So we have a chair. We now need a motion for a co-chair. This is Anita Bellinger. I nominate myself as co-chair. Do I have a second? Second. Motion has been moved and seconded. Let's vote. District one, Anita Bellinger. I agree. District two, Wanda. I agree. District three, Mr. Allen Kelly. Yes. District four, Ms. Barbara Mastella Oliver. I agree. District seven, Mr. Rodney Jones. I agree. Motion passes. Congratulations. We now have a chair and a co-chair. Um, we will follow up with both our chair and co-chair before the next meeting as they will assume the roles of managing our meetings via Robert's Rules of Orders. But thank you for stepping up and your willingness to serve. We're on a roll here with all of our 
motions have been unanimous so far. I hope we can keep that up. Uh, but moving forward, Ms. Ford, can we move forward with the next item on the agenda, please? Yes. The next item on the agenda is establishing meeting logistics. So per parks ordinance, the parks advisory board shall meet quarterly. The selected dates, times, and locations are currently the first Tuesday of every month, starting October 6th, January 5th, April 6th, July 6th. The current meeting time is 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And the in-person location will be Burdett Recreation Center or via Zoom. I'll entertain a motion to approve the meeting logistics. Um, I'm sorry, was that a motion? I'd like to, I'd like to um, debate, I guess, <laughs> that okay, so, time. Well, so the way we would do that is there's a motion to approve. If it's seconded, then we can have debate. And at that point, we can amend the motion or change the motion or change the days and time. So first step would be, okay. do I have a motion to approve the meeting logistics? I move that we uh, accept the uh, meeting logistics as stated. Do I have a second? I second the motion. All right, and now we will have debate. So I'm not sure which board member it was, but I know that someone wanted to have further discussion about District the District 2, Ms. Wanda. Ms. Wanda, go right ahead. Yes, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, right now I'm able to join uh, as a part of my lunch break, but if we were to return to the office, um, then one to three would be, um, wouldn't work for me. But I was wondering if the board would consider um, an evening meet time as opposed to midday. Okay. So is there any further discussion? Because at this point, what you could do is um, make a motion to amend the original motion and change or propose to change with your amendment the meeting time from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. to do you have a specific time that you would offer as an alternative? Um, okay. So I'd like to uh, make a motion to amend the meeting times from 1 to 3 to 5 to 7 or 6 to 8. All right. So you'd have to select one of them as part of your motion. So if, if the first one doesn't, is not approved by the board, then you could offer the second one. So do we want to start with five to seven? Five to seven. Okay, so there's been a motion to amend the meeting logistics motion to change the meeting time to 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Is there a second for that motion? I second that. The amendment I'll has second. been moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? If there's no further discussion, we will take a vote. The motion now stands that the board will meet the first Tuesday of the month, October 6th, January 5th, April 6th, and July 6th. The meeting time as the amended, per the amended motion would be 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. The meeting locations remain in person at Burdett Recreation Center or via Zoom as necessary. Let's vote. Ms. Anita Bellinger? I'm in agreement. Ms. Wanda? I agree. Mr. Kelly? I agree. Ms. Barbara? I agree. Uh, Mr. Ronnie Jones? I agree. Motion passes. Fantastic. Okay, the next item on the agenda, <clears throat> excuse me, the next item on the agenda is advisory board 
role and responsibilities. So per parks ordinance, the parks advisory board shall assist in the development of the city's parks master plan by making recommendations to the Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs regarding the master plan. The Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs shall include any recommendation it deems appropriate in its proposed plan for consideration by the city council. The advisory board shall meet with the Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs on a quarterly basis to carry out its duties set forth under the subsection above. As a part of those quarterly meetings, the Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs shall provide the board with an update on the status and implementation of the parks master plan. This particular agenda item board members is actually a point of information for you as board members. What Ms. Ford just uh, shared with you is actually verbatim from the parks ordinance as approved by our city council. So it is just intended to inform and let you know what the ordinance uh, prescribes as the role of the parks advisory boards. So I don't know that that requires a vote uh, as it is already uh, memorialized in the parks ordinance, but it is a point of information uh, that guides the uh, board and its role. Um, so next on the agenda, Ms. Ford, I believe, is yes. um, the history of the we move, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Mr. Phillips, before mm -hmm. we move to the next item of the agenda, mm -hmm. I just want to report that our District 5 representative uh, Mr. Johnny Clark has uh, logged in and joined the meeting. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not sure. We, we'll have to take up uh, uh, the swearing in of our District 5 member uh, okay. separately. Okay. Uh, so let's move forward with the next agenda item, please. Okay. The next item on the agenda is the City of South Fulton Department of Parks, Recreation, and Cultural Affairs History. Uh, Mr. Phillips will give a brief overview. So the Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs has evolved over the last approximately 45 years. It began as the Department of Fulton County Government many years ago, as many of you are probably aware, and has gone through a number of changes, iterations and improvements over that time. As it currently stands today, the department is, uh, consists of 17 parks, over approximately 692 acres, just uh, below 700 acres of uh, park space that is currently in the city. Approximately half of that is developed, meaning uh, athletic fields, uh, recreation centers, things of that nature. The other half of that is currently undeveloped. So we have a significant amount of undeveloped park space. Uh, in addition to the 17 parks, we have 12 facilities that we manage in the park uh, system as well. Uh, a number of recreation centers, many of you are familiar with Sandtown, Welcome All, Cliftondale, Burdett, uh, Creel Park, those aren't all of them. Um, and also we have, as of this year, two art centers uh, that are now a part of our department, the Southwest Art Center on New Hope Road. Hopefully some of you have had a chance to visit that facility over the years. The South Fulton Art Center, which is actually part of the Cliftondale Multipurpose Center and where we were holding council meetings before the pandemic kind of changed everything. Uh, and all looking forward on the horizon, um, as of December of this year, we will the city will assume ownership and the Wolf Creek Amphitheater will become a part of the Department of Parks, Recreation and Cultural Affairs as well. Uh, so that's just kind of a brief overview. We manage all of the programs in the department, uh, which run the gamut from youth athletics to instructor services to tennis. Uh, we now have an active theater, as you know, where we put performances on in our theater. Uh, we have an art gallery. Um, and then of course, we'll have a concert venue that will soon be a part of the department as well. So that's just a brief overview. We're gonna get into more detail. There's an exciting presentation coming up for you on our Parks Master Plan in just a moment uh, that we'll start to get into a little bit more of the program, program aspects of the department. But that's just a very brief overview. I do wanna pause at this moment because I believe Mr. Adams is back with us and can move forward with swearing in our District 5 Board member, Mr. Adams, you there? Oh uh, yes, I'm. I'm here. If you would proceed, and I believe it's uh, Mr. Clark. 
Mr. Clark, can you unmute yourself, please? Okay, I am unmuted at this time. Yes, Mr. Clark, welcome. And we would like to uh, swear you in as a member of the Parks Advisory Board. Um, what I would do is read the oath. And if you will repeat after me, uh, go through the oath, and at the end, uh, we will send you the actual oath via email. And if you could sign that and return that to the clerk's office uh, via email or U.S. email. So are you ready? I think, I think you're fading in and out. I can't understand everything you're saying. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, there you go. Okay. If you were to repeat after me, I state your I, name. Johnny Clark. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will truly discharge. That I will truthfully discharge. The duties as a member of the Parks Advisory Board. The duties of, uh, as a member of the Parks and Advisory Board. In all matters which require. In all matters which require. My official action. My official action. To the best of my knowledge and skill. To the best of my knowledge and skill. And I will so act. And I will so act. As in my judgment. As in my judgment. Will be most conducive. Will be most conducive. To the welfare and best interest. To the welfare and best interest. Of the entire city. Of the entire city. I do far, further solemnly swear. I do further solemnly swear. That I am not the holder of any unaccounted for. That I'm not the holder of any unaccounted for. Public money due this state. Public money due this state. And that I am otherwise qualified. And that I am otherwise qualified. To hold said office. To hold said office. According to the Constitution of the United States of America. According to the Constitution of the United States of America. Congratulations, Mr. Clark. You are duly sworn in. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Congratulations, sir. Thank you for joining us today. The last thing I wanted to share with you before we move to the next and uh, final part of our agenda for today is, you know, in addition to the brief overview I gave you, what I think is probably really important for all of us uh, to, to know and understand is our focus is on planning our, our path forward. Um, you know, uh, we became a city with a lot of aspirations and um, a lot of hope into what we can build and become together. Um, what exists today is a park system that we inherited from the county uh, in terms of facilities, in terms of a lot of the structure. And the next part of our discussion, which we're about to go into, is really a key portion of our vision for the future, building that roadmap for what we'd like to become. And a big part of what the role of this board is, is in helping to provide some input in the master plan. Many of you are probably also on the steering committee for the master plan. Uh, it is a huge uh, kind of foundational piece for the future of parks, recreation, and cultural affairs. And so your role in this is very vital because you are a direct input into the process. Uh, we'll share with you how the master plan process works in just a moment. And that will be an ongoing dialogue that we'll have uh, together in helping to uh, craft that vision along with the other things that you'll hear about. There's a lot of community engagement as part of this, um, but that future is what excites us so much is building how we move forward across all the varied and different aspects of parks, recreation and cultural affairs. And it covers pretty wide array. And so there'll be a lot of things that uh, we will have the opportunity to hear and chime in on. And with that, Ms. Ford, I'm gonna turn it back over to you to move us to the next part of our agenda. Thank you. The final item on our agenda is the parks master plan and process. Presenting today are our master plan consultants, Mr. Carlos Perez and Mr. Neelay Bott. And, and I'm sorry, before these two gentlemen start, I just wanted to give them a bit more of an introduction because we went through a very deliberate process um, when we wanted to select a consultant for this. Um, and we were very specific about what we needed in a consultant to help us do this and do it the right way. This plan is gonna guide us for the next 10 years. We had, I believe, over 20 submissions uh, of different firms that wanted to partner with us. And we went through a very specific, very deliberate process. And I'm very excited that we came up with what I believe is one of the leading uh, consultants in the country on this. And Perez Consulting, Mr. Carlos Perez, he's partnering with Neelay Bott. And I'll let him tell you more about Mr. Bott and 
his profile in this industry. But I just wanted you to know that these two gentlemen are highly qualified together. I know they've done hundreds of these master plans all over the country. And uh, so we're very fortunate that they are partnering with us in this effort. And with that, Carlos, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Good afternoon, Parks Advisory, and, and congratulations on this uh, first meeting, and uh, also to the uh, chair and co-chair uh, for uh, starting your role. So we look forward to working with uh, the entire board as we continue uh, this Parks uh, and Recreation Master Planning process. I'd like to, we, we have a presentation that we'd like to share with you uh, this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen, and I wanna make sure that everybody's seeing it. Can everyone see the cover slide? Yes? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and so what we'd love to share with you today is essentially the draft existing conditions and needs assessment summary findings uh, of the effort to date. I know many of you have uh, been engaged with us the last uh, several months as we've done different public engagement uh, strategies, uh, steering committee meetings, virtual public meetings, online surveys, et cetera. Um, and so we're at a point in the project where we'd like to share the draft findings of where we are today. Um, so this is, this is our agenda for uh, the meeting. We're gonna provide you a project overview and many of you have seen this before. So if you have, I, I, I just it'll be a, a brief uh, reminder. Then we're gonna dive right into the summary findings uh, from this effort. And then we'll open it up to a uh, question and answer and then talk about uh, next steps. But just to give you a background, um, the Parks and Recreation Master Plan uh, was an effort uh, identified by Mr. Phillips and uh, City Council uh, based on these goals. The idea was to develop a Parks Master Plan, uh, which is essentially a guidebook, a, a, a blueprint of uh, where the department should go over the next 10 years, all based on public input, best practices, analysis, et cetera. Uh, the idea was to look to enhance and diversify and add additional recreation programs maintain and upgrade facilities and infrastructure. And you'll see how that comes out through the process, especially considering as Mr. Phillips mentioned that you inherited the system from, uh, from the county. And then look at ways to provide STEM uh, based educational programming uh, at strategic locations. There was also a broader goal to this plan and that was to identify some of the social, economic, environmental issues and challenges that the city may be facing and, and exploring how parks and recreation may help uh, with, uh, with some of these factors. There's some really uh, great work happening all across the country on how park systems are addressing some of these difficult challenges. Uh, and so it was an opportunity to explore what those might be uh, you know, in the city and then see what the role of parks and recreation may be. It doesn't mean that we may be able to solve them, but at least we may be able to help address them. So that was another big part of this effort. As uh, Mr. Phillips mentioned, we put a team together to pursue this project and we were very excited to be uh, selected. Uh, our firm, Perez Planning and Design, uh, is leading the effort. We've completed over 100 of these uh, throughout the country. Then with us is uh, Pros Consulting and Mile Bot. He's the vice president of Pros Consulting. They've completed over uh, 300 of these uh, across the country. And Mile and I have been working together now for over 15 years on these efforts. Um, and then also working with a collaborative firm who's uh, helping us with public engagement and then ETC Institute. Um, who's uh, helped us with the statistically valid survey, which we'll talk about in a second. So collectively, we bring in over uh, the experience of having completed over 400 parks and recreation master plans across the country. And our process is uh, similar to a strategic planning process that many of you have perhaps been a part of. So it's these essentially uh, five phases. It starts with looking at the existing conditions, what we call the context analysis. Uh, then from there, we build off to the needs and priorities assessment. That's when we go out into the community and we collect public input uh, and get a, uh, residents' opinions on various factors. Uh, and then the findings from those two then lead us to the long-range vision. Once we establish the long-range vision, then we go back to the needs and priorities assessment to look at what the priorities were. And then that, those priorities then start informing the implementation strategy, right? the phased implementation strategy. And then ultimately we look to um, uh, create a final document and present this uh, to the city council or mayor for uh, adoption. What we're gonna share with you today is the findings from the context analysis and the needs and priorities uh, assessment. And we look forward to getting your comments uh, on that. 
This is a really key part of this process because it allows us to identify what those needs and priorities are. And many of you have probably seen this slide before, but it's our process on how to do this because there is no one technique that allows us to identify what the needs and priorities are. So we use a triangulated approach. We use three different techniques, qualitative techniques, observational techniques, quantitative techniques. The findings from those, when they overlap, then start suggesting what the citywide needs and priorities are. So for example, from a qualitative perspective, we do have a project steering committee that we've met with uh, already. We have the elected official interviews that we've completed. We did staff interviews, uh, virtual focus group interviews, uh, special events input prior to COVID. Uh, we did a few of those. We had an online survey that uh, uh, went, was live for quite a bit. Um, we also had a series of virtual public meetings, one for every district and one citywide. And then from observational techniques, we visited all your parks and with Mr. Phillips and Ms. Ford and staff, we uh, evaluated them and you'll see the findings of that today. We also looked at national trends and demographics, projected demographics, and uh, uh, looked at that as a way of how it would inform parks and recreation needs and priorities. Yes. And then lastly, we did use a series of quantitative techniques, statistically valid survey being the most uh, powerful, the strongest, because it's unbiased. It's mailed out into the community at random, so you may or may have not received the survey, and that's the point, because it's at random. Uh, it's matched to the demographics of the community, uh, and it gives us an unbiased uh, opinion of what the needs and priorities are. And then we do a lot of data crunching, looking at a variety of different things um, uh, to, all, to ultimately look at how these uh, work together to suggest, suggest citywide needs and priorities. For us, it was exciting because through all these techniques, uh, virtual public meetings, which we had a lot of the last few months. And even prior to COVID, we went to various special events. Uh, we got uh, the input of over 1,300 residents uh, from the community, which we were very, very pleased with. So the findings that you're going to see in the subsequent slides is based on the input from these residents of these participants, as well as the data and analysis that, that we conducted. So with that, let's, uh, let's dive right in. Uh, and share what these are. And so after doing, doing a lot of this analysis, these are the six key summary findings. We boil it down to six big ideas that we wanted to share with you today. And what we'd like to do is go through each one of these and then show you some data and some findings from all the analysis techniques to suggest how we uh, got to these six uh, key findings. The first one we're gonna talk about is the continuation of positioning parks, recreation, and cultural affairs as essential services. And you'll see some historical data, uh, um, kind of theoretical historical data, and then and, and how that applies to the city of South Fulton. Uh, the second big point was uh, uh, the need to upgrade existing parks, recreation, and cultural facilities. Then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the need to ensure equitable access and that, how that's a theme that really came out throughout this process. Uh, the need to enhance marketing and communications. Uh, also, the opportunity to customize parks, recreation, and cultural priorities based on the comments that we heard from residents. And lastly, opportunity to maximize resource generation and allocation. So what we'd like to do now is go through each one of these, and then Neela and I will be, Neela and I will be uh, uh, sharing some of the findings that we've collected um, uh, to date. So let's start with the first one. Continuing positioning parks, recreation, and cultural affairs as essential services. As, as many of you have uh, heard us present in the past, the parks movement in the United States back in the late 1800s really began as a response to health crises that the country was facing back then, very similar to what we're facing now. There was a series of epidemics and pandemics that many cities faced with. At the time, it was cholera outbreaks, typhoid fever, uh, even uh, a flu. Uh, and so the parks, uh, parks and open spaces really served as an antidote, as a solution, potential solution to some of these uh, uh, outbreaks. Um, in fact, the recreation center, the neighborhood center, the modern neighborhood center that we know today really started as a way to deliver a variety of community services, including parks and recreation, health and wellness, hygiene, uh, et cetera, into the neighborhoods. Um, and at the time, uh, President uh, uh, Roosevelt identified it as the most important civic innovation of its time. 
So as you can see, the park system really has a rich history in helping address some of the challenging issues that cities have historically faced. And we see the city of South Fulton doing that right now, right? So through the community drive uh, food giveaway, through the uh, uh, free grow box kit that they've provided during this pandemic and through its partners, it's really getting at helping uh, with some of these challenges that the uh, community is facing with and something that we were very excited uh, uh, and really applaud the city uh, for doing because it, it truly is addressing those challenging needs. In fact, when we asked um, our participants in the pu virtual public meetings, when we asked them how their perception or the value of parks um, uh, has uh, been impacted during COVID, 75% um, of respondents said that the value had increased or somewhat increased, which uh, we were really pleased to see. And then when we asked them how they would like to, based on that value, uh, how would they like the city to respond uh, for parks funding for the parks, trails, recreation, and cultural fairs, 92% of uh, respondents said they'd like to see an increase in funding. So showing the value of parks uh, uh, in this, to the city. And there's opportunities to address some other challenges. When we asked um, participants what social, economic, and environmental challenges were most important to their household, we saw that 73% of respondents said community safety and climate and then 50% said economic development. And these are things that we believe that parks and recreation and cultural affairs are very well positioned to help address. And so as we continue this plan moving forward in the visioning phase and subsequent phases, we'll be exploring uh, learning from case studies and then even talking to staff and others on how we can position the parks to help with some of these uh, challenges while also addressing the recreation needs and priorities of, of the community. And now Neely's going to talk a little bit about the great work that you've been doing from a virtual recreation standpoint. Sure. And I also, uh, before I go ahead, I want to introduce my colleague and an associate principal with Pros Consulting, uh, Mr. Philip Farnan. Um, so Phil's with me as well. Speaking to Carlos's point here, this was a terrific example of uh, the staff pivoting on the fly trying to make things happen to serve the community's needs. As we all know, as quickly as the pandemic hit and everything shut down, uh, you know, Ms. Ford, Mr. Phillips, they were looking for ways to still continue to engage the team as well. And this is a trend nationwide. We saw this very early on in certain agencies across the country, it challenged Ms. Ford and Mr. Phillips. And you'll remember our early conversations <laughs> to say, I would love for you to be among the very first, if not the first one in Georgia to do something like this. And they stepped out to their plate with an entire virtual recreation plethora of offerings that you're about to see as well. So if you didn't know it already, let me tell you what an awesome team you have out there that is creative, innovative, and committed to serving the community in whatever way they can. So Phil, do you want anything else? I just wanted to add, it's been a really, uh, we have a tremendous team at Parks and Recreation. I'm fortunate to work with some really outstanding professionals and all across the department, we have had staff to step up when this pandemic hit and figured out, our mission is to continue serving this community in this city, COVID-19 or not. And so we can't just go kind of sit in a corner while the pandemic's here and not do anything. So we've got a lot of people to step up, but one person in particular I wanted to mention, she's been kind of quiet today, but she's on the call as our deputy director, Ms. Chapin Payne. She has really been uh, key in this virtual programming uh, effort and has really led a lot of innovation and creativity in that arena. Her, Ms. Ford, uh, our recreation manager, Mr. Otis Key, and I have too many staff members, I probably should not start calling names because I've had so many of our team to step up and do a good job that uh, we're continuing to try to meet needs virtually. Uh, it's a new normal for us, right? We have to continue to figure out how do we serve the citizens of the city of South Fulton even with this pandemic in place. And so with that, um, I, I could go on a little bit longer, but I won't uh, belabor the point, Neelay, but you're right. You kind of challenged us several months ago to step up. And I'm proud to say that the hardworking folks in this department have stepped up to meet that challenge. Indeed. If I could add one point to that, Phil, before you speak, before the travel shut down, you all will remember I was there touring the sites, meeting the staff for the program, the operations assessment, all the rest. So as we start the staff meetings, uh, Ms. Payne walks in as well and we introduce and we talk. 
I said, how long have you been with the team? And she said, 24 hours. <laughs> and, and she, I mean, talk about hitting the ground running. She exactly. literally was on it with the plan, with the team. 30 days later, the pandemic hits. She doesn't miss a beat. So yes, no question, Mr. Phillips. That's Thank absolutely. you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. So, all right, Phil, over to you. You're on mute. Still on mute. Maybe try calling in from your phone. We'll carry on with this slide. Phil will pick up on the next one while you call in. Carlos, go ahead. Okay, very good. So that, that's, that was, a uh, again, the first point of positioning parts as essential services. The next big finding that we had that we wanted to share with you was the need to upgrade existing parks, recreation, and cultural facilities. And this is something that we heard across the board uh, uh, from all the elected officials, all the staff that we interviewed, and then even something that came out very, very loud through all the different techniques that we had. So for example, and, and when we asked participants, what were the barriers to parks, trails, and facilities? The number one was outdated and in need of improvement. Right? The fact that facilities are outdated and in need of improvements was a barrier to use. And then the third one that I thought was interesting was park facilities um, are not well maintained. And I want to talk about that a little bit because, be, because this is a product of an outdated system. There's only so much that staff can do to uh, maintain something that's, that's outdated, right? That the life cycle has, has uh, already passed. Uh, so even though Mr. Phillips and his staff, uh, uh, we felt uh, did a good job of maintenance, the uh, facilities are such that it's just very hard to make them look uh, like many residents would like them to look. Um, and then the second point of don't feel safe at parks and facilities we believe may also be a product of outdated and parks uh, not being, uh, not feeling well maintained. So in our minds, all these three are really interrelated and really suggest the need to upgrade uh, uh, the system overall. And this came out through our evaluations. We uh, uh, went with Mr. Phillips, or Ms. Payne and others to, to evaluate the parks. And so we have this evaluation form that we've used through the years. It has uh, over 20 different elements all within these uh, five uh, criteria. And so we would, we would go out to the park uh, and we would evaluate things, right? And this is possibly the most subjective part of the process because we are evaluating it based on a standard uh, established. Uh, we use one of the parks as a benchmark. Uh, and then we ask the question as a group, what do we think? Is this a, a one that needs improvement or is this a three that it meets expectations or is this a five that it exceeds, exceeds, exceeds expectations? So we work collectively to then score each of the parks. And overall, when you put all those scores together, the system overall uh, averaged at a 2.8, meaning that it's, it's still needing improvements. And then when you can see this map here where it shows the locations of the parks that we evaluated uh, and how they uh, essentially uh, were evaluated, right? Red being needs improvement, orange meaning that it doesn't meet expectations and yellow suggesting that it needs expectations. So, all to say that there's an uh, opportunity to improve and upgrade uh, the overall system. When we asked participants um, what actions they would support to improve the city system, 83% uh, of respondents said they were either very supportive or somewhat supportive of enhancing, upgrading, renovating existing parks and outdoor recreation facilities. And then 81% were also supportive of doing the same but for indoor recreation centers. Um, right, so again, all supporting this idea of elevating and improving the system overall. When we asked uh, uh, participants how they would allocate $100, if they had an extra $100 to spend on the system, how would they allocate it? And what we saw was almost $40 from those $100 would go to improving the system. And you can see the different elements in the slide where that came from. Improving maintenance of existing parks and outdoor recreation facilities, $15 improvement maintenance of existing indoor recreation centers, $15. And then out of the other, about $6 were associated with improving uh, the system. And we think this is also a really important piece when it comes to economic development and even community safety. Um, so for example, when you think of the impact that a green space has on uh, property values and economic development, uh, there's a lot of strong data that's uh, been done, a lot of really great data that's been done uh, through the years to show that um, 
next to a well-maintained or appropriately maintained green space, uh, homes living, homes within 100 feet of the park typically have an increase of over 20% uh, um, uh, in property values versus a home that's not adjacent to the park. And then that goes down, right? As you uh, live further away, if you're about 300 feet away, it typically goes down to somewhere in the 15%. Um, if you're about 600 feet away, it drops down around 5%. And then after 1,300 feet, essentially after a quarter of a mile, that impact uh, is not felt, right? That financial impact is not felt. What the studies also suggest is that if the quality is not good, it has the adverse effect, right? Um, uh, so this is an opportunity for us to think of how maintaining a good quality park system can not only help uh, increase property values, but also position uh, uh, the city and certain areas to uh, uh, encourage economic uh, development. So that was uh, the number two point. Um, the third key point that we wanted to share was this need to ensure equitable access. And again, this is something that we saw in various uh, techniques. Uh, the first one was simply mapping uh, public parks. So this is what we call park access level service. So how far residents have to travel to get to a public park. And what you're seeing here is all the, uh, the city and the county facilities that are within the city of South Jersey. The areas in orange, the lightest orange is the air, uh, area where residents can access a park within one mile. Uh, slightly darker orange is three quarters of a mile and the darkest orange is a half a mile. But the key here is how many white spaces we have throughout the city, right? Suggesting the need for additional parking. And when we break up the system and we analyze it in different ways, we see a similar story. For example, when you think of the community center, a similar uh, 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 theme. Again, this is the darker, in this case, the darker orange is one mile, the lightest orange is five miles, but you can see how there's some gaps um, uh, in the city. So again, residents not being able to access that within that time or within that distance. When we look at gyms, uh, it's the same thing. Again, the areas, the lightest ones are areas where residents can access a gym within five miles, the darkest ones are within one mile. And then even the art centers, um, you can see how uh, not the entire, this entire city does not have that equitable access. We also saw that, so that's from an access perspective, right? How, how far residents have to travel. We also saw that from a number standpoint when we look at park acreage. Um, the way park acreage is measured is counting how many acres per thousand population, right? So how many acres the city has and then comparing it to the population and then figuring out how many per thousand population. And so what we did is when we compared the city of South Fulton to other benchmarks, as you can see from this image, the city is pretty low in comparison to these benchmarks. What you see here is when we say NRPA benchmark one, that's National Recreation and Parks Association benchmark one, which is cities um, with a similar population to the city of South Fulton that have uh, shared their data with the National Recreation and Parks Association. Uh, when you see NRPA benchmark two, that's uh, city, uh, cities that have shared their information and have a similar population density to the city of South Fulton. Two important factors that we consider in parks planning. And then the other cities are cities that have a high percentage of the population that's Black or African American. So as you can see from all the comparison, from this comparison, uh, city of South Fulton uh, is ranked at 5.4 acres per thousand based on the 2019 population in comparison to all these others. Again, suggesting the need for additional parking. Now, when we break this up into council districts, the ones that you are representing, this is how the data pans out. You can see that some of the districts have very great uh, uh, park acreage because they happen to have these parks in their district, while there's uh, others that don't even have a park uh, or have very, very small acreage. Um, so again, suggesting that uh, there is a need for equitable access and distribution of parks. Um, and so now I'd like to turn over to, to Neelay and uh, Philip to talk about it from a financial perspective. Thank you, Carlos. <clears throat> So really the underpinning of this entire process is equity. Uh, and what Carlos spoke to is equity in terms of access to the offerings. What we're also talking about is equity in terms of ability to afford to participate. And this is, this is an important thing for you all as leadership to also keep in mind, because you're gonna hear us also talk about earned income and revenue generation and cost recovery, which is one aspect of it, and the other side is ensuring affordability 
for our community, knowing we have a number of low income families and for a lot of kids, we might be the only opportunity they have. So that's where we talk about scholarship policies to ensure that we have funding for pricing access for financially burdened families, but recognizing that because we don't have a high level of cost recovery through fee generation yet, we need to be looking at other non-user fee, non-tax supported opportunities as well, uh, including partnerships, sponsorships, uh, naming rights, et cetera. And I know Ms. Ford and the team is already also exploring creative options for virtual gaming and esports as well as an option to one, engage the kids and two, perhaps look at revenue generation from that standpoint too. Thanks, Carlos. So this is where we talk of, as we speak to cost recovery, true cost of service really is looking in terms of the direct, the indirect and the overhead costs of offering a certain program or an activity. So that includes everything from the direct materials that you would need and the staff time to the facility overheads and maintenance cost, all the way up to the leadership team with Mr. Phillips and Ms. Chapin as well to be able to say that a portion of their time is allocated to offering this program. So as you look at that, you know, those are the cost recovery goals that we have on the left hand side for each of the program areas. And we've only got a handful of those that currently have some semblance of cost recovery. So this isn't a typical, in a lot of places, special events or arts enrichment tend to be on the lower end of the spectrum. So an outcome of this plan is identifying based on the classification and the philosophies that Phil will share later in this presentation, how do we price and charge the fee for the programs? And what does success from a cost recovery standpoint look like for that program as well, as we balance equity of access and the ability to pay? Great, so we're, we're about halfway through this. Now we're entering the fourth big idea, which is enhancing, uh, enhanced marketing and communications. Neely, would you like to speak to some of these? Yeah, I mean, I think, and Phil can add to this as well, but this is one of the biggest pieces we hear, right? Uh, one of the top three reasons nationwide when people are asked, why don't you participate? Is, I don't know what's offered. Uh, it's about 35%, but in our case, we can see one out of two people don't participate, not because the staff's terrible, not because the facilities don't exist, but because they just don't know what's being offered. And there is a little bit of a, of a timing thing from our standpoint here, because we are a brand new department, right? It takes time for people to get used to knowing us, knowing what's being offered, getting into the rhythm as well. And honestly, just when we would have hit our stride this summer and exposed our offerings and shared awareness, unfortunately, the pandemic has, has slowed that down. So while yes, this is an important piece to us from a program and a marketing lens, this is less of a concern because this is something we can address immediately and at a significantly lower cost than if somebody said, you just don't have the facilities or the sports fields or the kind of places we want. So that's where this is an area that a year from now, two years from now, five years from now, as we keep monitoring, we're absolutely confident that that number as a barrier to participation will certainly go down. Well, do you wanna to speak to this? So as part of the uh, survey, word of mouth uh, had came up number one, as far as um, how people learn about the parks and activities of South Fulton. It's important to remember that word of mouth comes from many other sources, and those would be the department brochure, email blasts, and social media. And um, it is important just to make sure not to lose sight of that and make sure you're using those digital marketing avenues on a regular basis because they are leading to um, your reach as well as the number of 
of individuals that are speaking about the services that they're providing. And so that word of mouth um, is just one component in the larger scheme of things in the department can really do um, a great job as far as feeding that and, and trying to run contests and make sure that individuals are staying engaged. This slide also shows some really low hanging fruit and opportunities. For example, the biggest differences here is the website and the partner brochure. And those are really easy to do um, and, and, and well, relatively easy to do rather. But as you can see, compared to national average, uh, there's quite a bit of difference. Um, so one that, that can be uh, addressed uh, through this effort. Neela, anything you want to add to this one? No, I, I think especially the website right now, you know, all of us, this has become sort of the first place people are going to for information. Either they're going to their smartphones or they're going online to check for things. And now even more so as they're participating virtually. So the brochure and the print stuff, while the national average is 40%, that number has been shrinking over the years because fewer places are still printing things out that are more expensive and take a longer lead time to even print. But the website definitely is the highest priority as we look at marketing and recommendations for marketing. That's an area we'll be recommending very strongly in terms of building a, a truly accessible multilingual and mobile friendly online experience that allows us to best not only inform people, but also inspire them. And that's sort of a good you know, segue into talking about meeting people where they are as well. And so this is where Phil went through a deeper dive of the offerings that you currently provide and what we heard from people. Uh, and certainly Phil, please feel free to add to that as well. Yeah, I think by by and large, the virtual recreation presents itself as a great opportunity. Uh, you all have done a fantastic job with getting the virtual recreation off of the ground. And it's a newly tapped avenue for programming uh, that increases access to your services and offers a great opportunity to introduce viewers and followers to other services, including the opportunity to reinforce the department's brand that's currently under development. So just two more to share with you. The next one is customizing parks, recreation, and cultural priorities um, based on the, uh, the data that we heard from the community. So just as a reminder, uh, we use all these various techniques to, um, to identify what these needs and priorities are. The strongest of which, as I mentioned, was the statistically valid survey. So the findings that you're going to see in the next slides are really driven by them. Um, and the way we did this was by uh, asking uh, residents um, uh, two questions. Uh, one was when it dealt with facilities and, and, and programs is, is this facility or amenity important to you? Yes or no. Uh, and then the second question of that was how, uh, at, at what percentage is that, um, that program or facility met? At what percentage is that need met? Is that need met by 100%? So that need is, is completely met. Is it 75%, 50%, or 25%, or 0%? So the findings from those two questions then uh, suggest what the following priorities uh, uh, were. So we'll start with the high priorities, right? These are the facilities that residents uh, noted that were uh, important to them, but the need was not met very high. So what you're seeing here is the high priorities on the left based on the statistically valid survey. And then all the other techniques we compare to the statistically valid survey. So, survey. so we see where we heard them again. So for example, high priorities, the highest of which was paved multi-purpose trails. And this is something that we see across the country and in all the projects that we work on and some on, on the need that residents uh, uh, really uh, would like to see more of and are very important to them. But then you have indoor fitness centers, restroom and parks, senior centers, sidewalks, recreation centers, indoor pool and nature areas and nature parks. Indoor pool was interesting because in the survey, in the online survey, it was a, it showed up as indoor pool. And then when we talked to the steering committee and the virtual uh, public meetings, and even in the, with elected officials, the idea of an aquatic center also uh, um, came up in, dis in discussion quite a bit. So you can see how these are, again, the amenities that are uh, important to residents and the need is not met as high. Uh, and this is this is citywide. We also have similar findings that we'll share with the elected officials for each of the each of the districts. Um, the medium priorities. 
uh, you can see what some of them were uh, orgy. So everything from unpaved walking and hiking trails to indoor gymnasium, teen center, uh, multi-purpose field. And then, because again, so you can see the findings from the statistically valid survey here on the left, and then where we heard them uh, throughout uh, the process. So again, I thought this was in interesting. Outdoor pool, splash pad spray ground, uh, coming out high and something that we heard in, in, in uh, all the techniques. Or rather, coming out medium, but, but something that we heard in all the techniques. And then if you combine it with a high priority of the indoor pool, you start seeing that aquatics facility component. And then the last one from a facility standpoint are the look priorities. Again, these are elements that may be important to residents, but the need is already met, right? They feel comfortable with the services that the city uh, uh, and other providers are currently providing. So it's not as high of a priority as the other ones that we've seen. And so athletic fields typically fall within this category. Right? Because if you think of the broader population of the city, not everybody plays athletic sports. It's usually a small percentage of the population, but it's a very, very vocal group. But again, uh, here you can see how it's, uh, when we, when we uh, through the statistically valid survey, it came out as, a, as a, a low priority. So that's amenities. We did the same analysis for programs. Um, so these are high priority programs. Again, programs that were uh, important to residents and the need was not necessarily met in a high manner. Um, so you can see fitness and wellness programs, very high, learn to swim, senior leisure programs, and community special events. You can see the statistically valid survey response here, and then how the other techniques, how we heard it from the other uh, techniques. And then medium priorities, you can see those here. Uh, again, statistically valid survey and how it ranked, but then also where we heard it through the other uh, techniques. So water fitness was something that we heard in uh, several techniques, performing arts and dance, team programs, and then uh, summer camps um, as well. And summer camps typically very popular. And then lastly, the low priorities. Again, these are things that may be important to residents, but they feel that they are provided at, at a high percentage. Um, and so you can see some of the ones uh, here uh, as well. I'll give you a few, a few seconds to just look at these uh, as well. But again, the idea here is that we're going to use these findings to then help establish a vision moving forward and also prior, prioritize. When we get to the phase implementation, we're going to have limited funds, right? Just like everything, there's limited dollars for implementation. So we're going to go back to this after we develop a long range vision and, and look at how we can, where should we prioritize. Uh, Neil and Philip, um, uh, next is about the core programming. Thank you, Carlos. So to Neely's point earlier, a deeper dive was taken into programming to ensure a fresh supply of services, including new trends uh, in recreation programs within the region. So we worked with Mr. Phillips, Ms. Chapin, and Ms. Ford to categorize specific programs into what we call core program areas. And so these are, um, this is a way to organize the smaller programs uh, such as um, Zumba, yoga, into uh, health and wellness as an example. Um, these are also designed to help residents find uh, pretty easily what they're looking for by area of interest and or age segments. So we can also see from uh, the existing core programs that you have here uh, that there might be an opportunity to add virtual recreation as uh, the department moves forward as well. Age segments that you see to the right show a pretty good distribution of uh, age segments being served by the department. Um, the primary uh, which is the P that you see in each age segment and core program area. Uh, the primary are the age segments that are most targeted within that core program area and the services that they provide within that area. Those that are identified as secondary age segments are not specifically targeted, but demonstrate an interest in the programming that are being offered within that core program area. And we do see some opportunities um, in, the, in the way of seniors um, to what Carlos was talking about with high priority senior programming came in pretty high. And there's an opportunity to make that a primary uh, with the services that are provided through recreation department. Next slide, please. The key takeaway is that the programs here are in the early stages of the life cycle. You see 
in green 76 percent uh, within this life cycle of introduction takeoff and growth we categorize those three as the introductory uh, life cycle stage and typically around 50 to 60 percent is good considering the history um, that Tony was going over earlier regarding your department, um, it's understandable that there would be a, a large number of programs in introductory and takeoff. Um, it is also um, typically common for us to see uh, saturated and decline be higher than 10%. And with parks and recreation professionals, there are a lot of folks that they see firsthand who are benefiting from the programs and services they provide. So it can make retiring uh, saturated or declining programs a little bit easy, but that's not a concern here for the department. We just want them to monitor that moving forward. And we also know that some of the programs within introductory and takeoff will eventually transition into growth as well as into mature as well too. So those high numbers are actually a pretty good thing to see. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the program classification process we worked on with the department here is one that is transferable to other major functions and services of the department. This helps with decision making. So we'll take a look at the several factors that are involved. Obviously, the factors on the left hand side, public interest, is there a legal mandate or is it mission aligned for uh, the program and or service? Uh, financially sustainable, uh, does it fall within free nominal uh, programs or does it fall within important programs where the fees are covered, some direct and some indirect? Um, or value added programs where the fees are mostly covered by the direct and indirect costs uh, of providing the program. And then you have who benefits. So there's health, safety, protection of assets, et cetera, as far as the benefits for the public, but who benefits? Um, if it's set as an essential program classification in that second column from the left, you'll see that substantial public benefit is typically where that lies. So um, if not provided, the public would be rather upset, uh, would be calling Mr. Phillips on a regular basis asking for that program to be reinstated. If it's an important program within those benefits, it's got a mix of public and of uh, individual benefit. Uh, some of the some of the examples that we use here would be uh, like a learn to swim program. Swim lessons are pretty important. The public benefit is uh, teaching the community how to swim and making sure that everyone is safe um, to avoid uh, any potential fatalities. Where the individual benefit is obviously learning to swim and being able to respond to those moments when in the water uh, with play. And then finally, value added is primary the individual benefit. So an example for this would be if you're using, uh, if you're reserving a facility for uh, a gathering of your family or of colleagues and coworkers, the folks that attend that specifically are benefiting and that's where you have a higher cost recovery. We also take a look at the competition in the market. Is it low? Uh, is it uh, medium? Or is there a high amount of competition within uh, that market? Um, and this is not to say that the competition is bad. Those folks that are competing may also eventually become partners in providing those services uh, at some point as well. And then more importantly is the access. Um, typically when it's essential, there's open access to all. Uh, when it's important, uh, there is open access, but access may be limited to specific users during certain times. And then value added is limited access uh, to specific users. So typically you'll see a best cost recovery for essential uh, between zero to 50%. And then from important, you'll see from 50 to 75% and 75 plus percent cost recovery for those in value added. We currently see the South Fulton program distribution as 15% are identified as essential, 26% are identified as important, and 59% as value added. Um, that is not to say that um, those cost recoveries are all being hit by each and every program within there, um, but the vast majority are as far as the core program area is uh, concerned. There is one more note to, to make here, and there is no ideal program distribution. Uh, 
Um, the program distribution in that bottom row uh, represents um, and is specific to each community. So what are the mission, uh, what is the vision and the values for the department and the community? And, and so those are unique to each. It is something that we do recommend tracking um, typically uh, to clients on an annual basis. So you can see the evolution of your program classifications. Next slide. <clears throat> so here you see, yes. Sorry, one thing Carlos on the previous slide, please. Uh, I think the only the key important piece is while there isn't a recommended uh, percentage, it's important to ensure that our essential programs are always fewer than important and value added. Because the reality is if everything is essential, then either one, you don't know what truly really essential is, or two, you have no way of recovering any revenues, in which case you cannot be financially sustainable. So over time, even the essential programs will start needing to get cut or pared back. Yeah, good point, Neelay. Um, and that's a really good tool that the department can utilize um, by looking at those factors and even reprioritizing those to whichever is most important to ensure that uh, future decisions are made using the tool. So as we see here, uh, we have a very diverse pricing strategy currently uh, being used by the department. Um, and just to run through a few of these, age segment, we uh, had covered age segments that are being served uh, a few slides back. So you definitely know that the age segment is also being used as part of the pricing strategy. Uh, residency is another uh, one that is heavily used as well as market competition and by cost recovery goals. So there is an opportunity um, in the uh, customer's ability to pay um, as part of that social equity and access uh, piece that we've been discussing. And so as we move forward, we'll be looking at how best to implement that with the, the department in current structure, but also opportunities for improvement there as well, too. Perfect. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Now we're getting to the last big idea, and then we're going to open it up to question uh, and answer and discussion. And so the last big idea was this idea of maximizing resource generation and uh, allocation. Um, so Neil and Philip, the programmatic yeah. piece. Yeah, I think this is an ongoing piece. One aspect is programmatic, the other is operations. And this is more to do with internally how we will do things, right? Uh, arts and culture is such a huge part of the brand and the DNA, which isn't typical for departments this size to have the kind of facilities you do. So how do we continue using that to build our brand and better tell our story? Uh, to identify current and future target markets that we define. And once we have those defined to ensure that internally, we've got the program metrics, the standards, the QA, QC, the quality assurance, quality control, so that the experience looks and feels the same from one place to another. Uh, in a prior life, I used to work for Disney. And so you know, no matter which park you go to, it may be different from an Epcot to Animal Kingdom to Magic Kingdom, but at the end of the day, it is still the Disney experience. And that's the same thing we would love for South Fulton to be able to have is what is that South Fulton experience, no matter where somebody goes to, that's where those standards and the quality measures really come into play. Uh, of course, as part of the work and you saw the survey results in terms of communication and lack of awareness, that's an aspect we're gonna to have to continue building upon and developing so there's accurate and consistent communication. And a lot of this for you all as leaders is gonna come down to managing the community's expectations. Uh, you all know this better than I do. Uh, the wants are gonna be unlimited. The resources, not so much. So using the tools that Carlos showed as well in terms of prioritizing, how best do we use this plan to recommend the greatest good for the greatest number of people and always with an equity lens in mind, that's gonna be critical for us to measure and achieve success. And that's the programmatic side, right? So operationally, Carlos, for the next one, uh, this is where, because it's a brand new team and an agency, Phil and I are providing a lot of best practice and next practice recommendations to say, if you were to build an ideal operation from scratch, what could that look like with respect to service delivery, with respect to managing public, 
private and nonprofit partners? What kind of key performance indicators, KPIs should we track? So we're not just measuring effort to say, we're really, really busy. We're measuring outcomes to say, did we deliver these programs? Did we get a certain level of participation? Did we get a certain level of cost recovery? Uh, Phil had a really good point as we spoke about this in terms of looking at an internal assessment with respect to how we approach cultural affairs going forward. Uh, and all the time as we're talking of improving our experience for the external customers, we can't lose sight of the internal customers, which are our own staff. Right? There's a saying uh, that we always had at Disney, which is the most important person is your customer, but the most important customer is your own staff. So at a time like this, how do we ensure we're investing in professional development for the staff to train, nurture, and grow them? And how do we establish standards for customer service, uh, for onboarding from the time somebody joins in to how they greet people, to reward and recognition for the staff as well, uh, are all these issues that we can certainly look into uh, as we enhance and speak to operations. Phil, did you have anything else to add as well from your deeper dive? No, you covered all the bases. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Carlos. And so the following slides show some of the uh, opinions that we got from participants, right? So uh, when we were doing the virtual public meetings, and you've seen the slide already, but just as a reminder that the value during the, the uh, during COVID, the value for 75% of respondents had increased or somewhat increased, and they had 92% uh, of those respondents would like to see an increase in, in funding. Then when we asked participants through the statistically valid survey, their willingness, willingness to pay increased taxes per month, um, it was interesting to say that while 40% said no additional taxes, we had 60% that said they'd be willing to pay anywhere from a dollar to $5 per month and increase taxes uh, to see an improvement uh, in, their own, in their overall system. Um, so if you compare that to the population of the city now, uh, it can be anywhere from uh, generating 1.2 million a year upwards to 6 million uh, a year if that were to be the case. And then when we asked where these sources of funds, uh, they, they uh, they'd like to see, obviously grants and philanthropic contributions are always hot, right? And so this speaks to an opportunity for the city to leverage uh, tax dollars and, and, and bond dollars uh, with uh, grants and, and philanthropic contributions. So again, um, uh, a summary again, what were the six B big uh, key findings? Again, continuing to position parks and recreation and cultural affairs as essential services that the department is doing now. Uh, as we saw, there is definitely a need to upgrade existing parks, recreation, and cultural facilities. You have inherited an old, older system that hadn't seen a great deal of capital improvements uh, in a while. And even though staff uh, continues to maintain them, there are certain things that are just beyond maintenance. Um, as we saw, there's definitely a need to en enhance uh, equity and equitable access uh, of the system. Uh, also an opportunity to enhance marketing and communications to let residents know what's the city is offering, and that's a very low-hanging fruit uh, that can happen. Uh, and then opportunity to customize parks, customize parks, recreation, and cultural priorities based on the needs uh, of residents as expressed through the different techniques. And lastly, opportunities to maximize resource generation and allocation uh, to help the city uh, uh, move forward in a financially sustainable way from a parks and recreation standpoint. So with that, we thank you for uh, listening to us uh, for this period. Um, uh, and then we'd love to open it up for uh, discussion. Any questions uh, you might have, uh, we'd be happy to, uh, to answer them at this point. Mr. Phillips, uh, Ms. Ford. Yeah, thank you, Carlos. Uh, at this time, we've concluded our Parks Master Plan presentation. I will start with the open floor to our board members. If you have a question, comment, feedback, feel free at this time. And then right after our board members, we will also open for a few moments to um, some of the other participants who are on the call. We have a few council members as well as our council members, legislative assistants. So we'll start with our board members. If anybody has comment, questions, feel free to take the floor. This is Barbara, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I'm from district four. Um, for those, as far as the finances and those areas like uh, District 4 that have very limited uh, park 
and recreation and other programs open to the district. Are there any, are there financial limitations as to what can be built or developed in those areas like District 4? So um, this is Tony Phillips, that's a very good question. Um, the environment that we work in as municipal government is there's always some limits <clears throat> to the amount of revenue that we have available to create new programs, to develop uh, uh, new opportunities, facilities, renovation, things of that nature. Everything comes down to cost. And you know, you heard a little bit in that presentation about cost recovery and revenue streams, things of that nature. There's an entire mix of factors that go into that. But to answer your question, yes, you know, there's a finite limit to the number of financial resources we have. That being said, part of what this process is going to help us to do is to maximize those opportunities as best we can to look for alternative sources of funding and revenue so that we can begin to, as we aspire and look at what we'd like to do, you know, District 4 needs more opportunities. Our entire system needs more opportunities. District 7 doesn't even have a park. It's the only district in the city that doesn't have a park at all. So clearly we have room to grow and things we wanna to do to expand opportunities, access to facilities, level of service, all those things, but we have to do so in a fiscally responsible way. We're in the middle of kind of our early part of the budget season right now for FY21. So we're putting together budgets now. Well, the environment we're in right now is that revenues are down for all municipal governments because of the pandemic, right? So a lot of the revenue that would have been coming in the cities has slowed down because everyone's been at home for the last four or five months. And so they haven't been engaging in programs and a lot of the revenue is different or altered. And so, you know, that's part of our mission is to function within the resources we have available while consistently looking to identify new and different ways that we can fund our aspirations or our, our vision for the future. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions, comments from the board? We don't have any questions from board members. I will open the floor to some of our uh, council members or legislative assistants. If you guys have questions or comments, feel free. You want to speak all at once. <laughs> now everybody jump in all at the same time. Well, I, I will tell you this, this is Tony again. I know this is a lot of information for the initial meeting. And as you can tell, a lot of really good work has gone into the presentation you saw today. And there's a lot of data that informs this presentation. And we're just, you know, the first couple of stages or phases into this master plan, there's more to come. Uh, we've got three more phases in front of us. And so I know this is a lot to consume in a single presentation. You will get this presentation uh, emailed to you from Ms. Ford, so you can go through it as you choose to at your own leisure and kind of uh, if you have additional questions after the meeting, you can always contact any of our staff members, myself, Ms. Payne, Ms. Ford, we're always accessible to you to try to answer questions. We'll probably do some other additional things between now and the next meeting, which is send you some other additional information about parks and recreation. As you can see, uh, this is a little bit more involved than it may have seemed initially, right? There's a lot that goes in to parks, recreation and cultural affairs. Uh, we'll send you some information from the National Recreation and Parks Association. You heard the reference NRPA during the presentation. That stands for National Recreation and Parks Association. They do a really outstanding job of surveying over 2,000 agencies on a regular basis to kind of come up with some benchmarks of agencies like ours all over the country so that we can kind of look at some of those metrics and see how we compare to other agencies across the country. So we'll kind of forward some of that information to you. So. I understand that it's a lot of information that digest in a single presentation right now, but please know that this is your only opportunity to ask questions. Um, and then as we move forward, when you get a chance to digest some of this a little bit more, or if you have questions that happen to come to you after the meeting, we're always available to try to see if we can't provide some additional information. Right, just to um, share next steps, um, the next step of this process is we're going to, we're in the process of finalizing a report document, a very big report um, for these two phases. 
Uh, and then we're going to share this with the elected officials uh, and, and, um, uh, to get their uh, input. Um, and then we're going to enter the visioning phase. And there's two aspects to the visioning phase. The first one is the visioning phase, uh, looking at the system as a whole, uh, really looking at how the, system, the, the city wants to respond to some of these needs and priorities. The second phase of that visioning is creating conceptual master plans for each of the city's parks. Um, uh, so that's something that we look forward to getting to in, in the month of September. Um, uh, and then that'll take us to about uh, November, December on the visioning phase, then implementation December, January, and we hope to wrap this up by uh, March of 2021. So uh, there'll be other opportunities to engage with you and we look forward to, to doing so. Uh, as Mr. Phillips mentioned, uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, we look forward to hearing them and, and answering them uh, as best we can. Uh, and again, thank you for the opportunity to present to you this afternoon and congratulations on your first uh, meeting. So I'll, I want to uh, again reiterate that uh, congratulations everyone and thank you for participating and look forward to our work together over the coming months and years. Uh, there's a lot in front of us and uh, we've got a lot to do. Um, you guys are really valuable to us because you're part of the eyes and ears of this department. Uh, all of you are based in our communities and I know most of you, I know several of you, and I know you have uh, vast contacts throughout our, our different communities. And so as you hear things, whether it's something we need to do better, uh, as you hear things that maybe we need to focus on, uh, that's part of the role of this board is for you to feel free to contact our staff. It also helps us if you are also the voice of the department so that when we're going through this master plan process and we have citizen engagement opportunities, be they virtual meetings, opportunities for people to chime in and tell us what they'd like to see for the future. You can help get the word out for that and help people to understand that there's a role for them in developing the future of parks, recreation, and cultural affairs. The last thing I'll tell you before we get ready to move to our adjournment is that we're in the midst of preparing our FY21 budget. So I would encourage you, uh, most of you probably do this anyway if you're on this board, but keep your eyes and ears open. There'll be a, 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 a proposed budget coming forth to the public sometime in the next few weeks, take a look at that for the city's budget overall. And as Parks Advisory Board members, take a look at it to see what the Parks and Recreation budget looks like um, so that you can kind of familiarize yourself with that. And so if there aren't any other questions, I believe we are now at the point where we are um, prepared to adjourn our meeting. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn the meeting. Is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. That motion passes. Thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. We really appreciate it. We're looking forward to the future. Thank you to uh, Carlos and Mila as well, as all of you have joined the meeting today. Enjoy the rest of your day and have a good afternoon. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.